Okay, I think we will get started given that it is um, three o'clock in uh, CET and 9 a.m. in the East Coast. Uh, my name is Greta Fenner. I'm the Managing Director of the Basel Institute on Governance. And it's a great pleasure um, to co-host this webinar at the occasion of the UN General Assembly on Corruption together with my colleague Emil from the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative. It's a particular pleasure to co-host with Emil and Star because we really consider not Emil alone, but the entire uh, STAR group very much as our partners in uh, anti-crime. Um, the topic of today's webinar, non-conviction-based forfeiture, is, is a topic that we at the Basel Institute on Governance and our International Center for Asset Recovery have had on our radar as theory and as practice for, for quite some time. And it is a no surprise that the same, I am sure, can be said uh, about our colleagues from the STAR initiative. As organizations, both of us, dedicated to helping countries recover stolen assets, it has been for some time that we realized how important non-conviction-based forfeiture is as a tool uh, in their efforts to recover stolen assets. Um, together, we uh, are both organizations hope to be able to help as many countries as possible to adopt this set of tools or, or to use it more with a view to recover uh, stolen assets. And, and therefore this webinar very much is, is, is a joint effort to try to achieve this critical mass of countries who are using this uh, tool more frequently. We are um, step by step uh, approaching the critical mass. We're still not quite there, but we do see increasingly states turning to non-conviction based forfeiture as a means to recover proceeds of corruption and other criminal activity. And in fact, it's very, uh, gratifying to see that the political declaration that will be adopted this week in New York at the UN General Assembly makes multiple references to uh, non-conviction based forfeiture and similar, similar tools. But as we see more uh, countries adopting NCBF and is often the case with new legal tools or new tools in general, we also see that of course there are challenges that are coming up which may not have been entirely foreseeable when the theory of non-conviction based was was introduced or, or when not so many examples uh, were available. Um, we also see quite a range of different models uh, being adopted, uh, none of which is the perfect right answer or the perfect wrong answer. They all give answers to the issues at stake. And that's very much the purpose of this webinar, to share experiences from other countries, to make countries that are interested in adopting such a tool aware of some of the issues that they need to consider in particular also in relation to mutual legal assistance as non-conviction based forfeiture will in many cases require the assistance from other states through MLA, et cetera, et cetera. We have one hour only, so I'll keep the introduction very short because we have uh, fantastic speakers with us today. Um, and with that, I'm already handing over to Emil, please to introduce our speakers and kick off the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greta. Thank you for those kind words to start. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you joining us here today. It's, it's a great pleasure to be discussing this with you and welcome you on behalf of STAR, the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative. Um, very happy to be partnering with ICAR on this. Um, STAR is, is um, an organization that assists countries in uh, recovering stolen assets, but also does a lot of knowledge work and uh, produces advocacy papers. And one of the uh, papers, one of our first papers, or papers reports uh, a long time ago already was on non-conviction based forfeiture. Um, and that is uh, desperately in need of an update. And we're very glad to have our first panelist who has written very extensively on this topic already, Steph Casella, uh, work with us on this. Um, so, very happy to, um, to, to have uh, Steph on, on this panel. He's joined by a very distinguished uh, group of people from many different walks of life. Patrick Kunzbrook is a public prosecutor from the Duchy of Luxembourg and as prosecutor had to deal with um, executing a non-conviction based forfeiture request in his own jurisdiction, which doesn't have non-conviction forfeiture. So he will talk a bit about the challenges um, in that uh, respect, how do you execute something like that? We have Oscar Solazano, who as a senior um, uh, specialist um, for the ICAR uh, is, is, has 
worked a lot in um, Latin America and has advised countries a lot on non-conviction based forfeiture and can speak from that perspective. And then we have Nona Tsutoria, who as a judge uh, at the European Court of Human Rights had to deal with one of the landmark cases on non-conviction based forfeiture and its possible conflict or not. And that's of course what we will be discussing on uh, with human rights in the uh, case of Jorge Tizze forgive my mispronunciation, Nona, uh, against Georgia, which was one of those uh, landmark cases and, and, and we will share a bit of her insights. I will not dwell on, on the backgrounds. They are all very distinguished, eminent professionals, but you can find more of their background of each of the panelists in the uh, accompanying documentation for this panel. One word of housekeeping um, <clears throat> uh, for to make things as smooth and efficient as possible and make best possible use of our time, please use the, to all our participants, please use the Q&A function in uh, this, uh, uh, at the bottom of your screen to ask a question as it comes up. Of course, we will try and deal with it during the session. It is very possible that um, it'll be beyond uh, the one hour mark. And in that case, we will try and deal with answering your question in the meeting notes for uh, this panel. So that concludes the housekeeping rules. With that, let's jump straight in. And um, I'd like to first, first turn to Steph Casella. Steph, you have written very extensively on this topic. Uh, I think it'd be helpful for all our participants to, to be on the same page, to know a bit, you know, what are the basic concepts underlying non-conviction based uh, forfeiture and how can it be a useful tool in the fight uh, against corruption and in ensuring the recovery of stolen assets. Steph, you have the floor, thank you. Well, thank you, Emil, and uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in the panel. Uh, NCB forfeiture is a law enforcement tool. Um, it's a means of recovering the proceeds of crime or other property tainted by uh, criminal activity when it's not possible to recover that property through a criminal prosecution and a conviction. Uh, it does not require a criminal conviction, but nevertheless, in all other respects, it's a law enforcement action in which the government bears the uh, burden of proof and it has to prove that a crime was committed and that the property in question was tainted by its connection to the crime. Uh, this process is well known in the United States. Um, it's well known in most common law countries and in an increasing number of uh, civil law countries as Greta has mentioned. Its uh, popularity reflects the need for a tool that allows um, the recovery of property uh, that is criminally derived, criminally tainted when going uh, through the process of obtaining a criminal conviction and making the confiscation part of the sentence is not possible. In other words, it fills a gap in the law. Um, in the United States, we've been doing this for over 200 years. It began in the 18th century uh, with respect to pirate ships and ships involving in, in the slave trade when we could lay hands on the ship, but not lay hands on the owner. And because we had the property in hand, we brought the action against the property and uh, were able to recover what needed to be recovered in that regard. Um, so in the United States and in many other places, a non-conviction-based forfeiture is an in-rem action. That is, it's an action not naming a person as the subject of the action, but naming the property as the subject uh, of the action. Um, in the United States, we actually include the property, the name of the property in the caption of the case. And that's why our cases have what sound like unusual or funny names to people. The United States of America versus $1 million, for example. Um, that doesn't mean that the property has done something wrong. It doesn't mean that the property has to defend itself in court. It's uh, simply a convenient way of letting the world know that this is the property against which the government is moving because the government believes that it's derived from or used to commit uh, a crime. In short, an NCB confiscation or forfeiture is simply a procedural device that gets everyone with an interest in the property into court at the same time uh, so that they can contest the government's uh, belief that this property is criminally uh, tainted. Let me give a typical example, uh, a real case from my experience. Uh, the police discover that a drug dealer has been murdered. His body is lying on the pavement and inside his car is $90,000 in cash. And the government seizes the $90,000 in cash. There's no possibility of a criminal prosecution. It simply brings an action naming the property and it says, 
who claims this? And if no one does, it's forfeited by default. But if someone comes forward and claims the property, perhaps his widow, perhaps his child and heir, perhaps his business partner who claims the money was really from a landscaping business, whatever, uh, then the government litigates with that person. So in an NCB uh, confiscation or forfeiture action, the government is the plaintiff. The property is the thing or the race that is the subject of the action. And anyone who wishes to come forward and contest it is an intervener who has to establish that he has an ownership interest in the property and therefore has standing to contest it. In my example, the, of the $90,000 in cash in the drug dealer's car, the government would be the plaintiff, the $90,000 would be the, the race, the subject of the action, and the, the mother or the child or the business partner would be the intervener. Now, how does it work? The government would begin the case uh, by bringing an action. It would file an action in, in the court. Uh, in our courts, it can, it's the same court that you would bring a criminal case in. And we have no distinction between civil courts and criminal courts. Uh, the government brings the action. If the property is not already in the government's possession, it would ask the court for an order to seize or restrain the property pending the litigation. The government then has to send notice to all persons who would have a potential interest in the property uh, of their right to make a claim. And they would have a certain number of days in which to respond. Uh, then the case would proceed as follows, assuming someone responds. The claimant or the intervener has to establish standing. Do they really have an interest in this property? And they're not just some person who was walking down the road when they saw that the property was being seized by the police. So they have to establish a legal interest in the property. The government then would have to establish two things by a balance of the probabilities, that a crime was committed and that this property was derived from or used to commit the crime. And if the government meets its burden and establishes that the property is subject to forfeiture, then the burden would shift back to the intervener to establish that he has an affirmative defense if he wishes to raise one. And the possible affirmative defenses would be that I did not know that my property was being used to commit a crime or that I acquired this property as a bona fide purchaser for value and did not have reason to believe that it was subject to forfeiture when I acquired it. And then there's one other uh, defense that can always be raised, and that is that notwithstanding the government's proof that the property was criminally derived and notwithstanding uh, the failure of the claimant or intervener to show that he is, um, has an affirmative defense, nevertheless, it can be argued that the forfeiture would be grossly disproportional to the gravity of the offense. In other words, there's a proportionality rule that's implicit in, um, in the action being brought by the government. So uh, for example, someone uses his wife's car to rob the bank, uh, but she knew nothing about it. Then the wife would be able to come forward and lay claim to the car, say it's my car and I did not know my car was being used for this illegal purpose. If she prevails with her affirmative defense, she gets the car back and the government has to pay her attorney's fees under, under United States law. And if she does not prevail, if she cannot establish that she's an innocent owner, then the property would be uh, confiscated, it would be forfeited, notwithstanding the fact that she has not been convicted of any crime. Now, finally, when would you use uh, this, this tool? When does it come in, uh, into use? Uh, there are many, many instances, but uh, I'll just name a few. When the wrongdoer who committed the crime is dead or he's incompetent to stand trial, or when he's been pardoned, that has happened in the United States. When uh, the wrongdoer is a fugitive, or he is a foreign national beyond the jurisdiction of the state and cannot be prosecuted uh, for one of those two reasons. Uh, when the statute of limitations has already run on the criminal offense, but now we have found the property. Uh, when the uh, property has been recovered, but we don't know who the wrongdoer was, it's clear that the property is criminally derived, but we don't know the, the, the identity of the wrongdoer. When the uh, wrongdoer has already been convicted of some other crime, uh, or has been convicted of this crime in another jurisdiction and there's no point in bringing another prosecution. Um, when the um, interests of justice do not justify bringing a criminal prosecution, but a civil re remedy um, might be the more appropriate way of proceeding with a, a case. Um, we do that all the time when we seize firearms um, and don't have any uh, belief that the person was committing a crime, but they might have been a convicted felon or something of that nature, you just can see, you would seize the firearm. 
Um, and then finally, when uh, uh, someone is using someone else's property to commit the offense, like in my example of the person who uses his wife's car. And then finally, in public corruption cases, when um, bringing a prosecution is taking a very long time, but it's necessary to seize the property and uh, make sure it doesn't disappear while the criminal case is being uh, put together. So that's my, my quick uh, sort of uh, summary of how this works and when you would use it. And I look forward to everyone else's um, contributions. Thank you very much, Steph. I have to say that even if I didn't know before how useful NCBF was, you would have definitely convinced me and, and listening to you, I think, especially when you described how NCBF, you know, when you can use or when NCBF is a useful tool, just made me think of the many, many instances that we see in partner countries, and I'm sure STAR as well, where exactly, you know, so many of the situations in which we find ourselves fully, uh, fully compare with the list of, of, of opportunities that you, you mentioned. Let me turn now to Oscar, who speaks um, to us from Peru. Uh, and who has uh, worked very closely with the Peruvian government um, over the last few years, both in terms of, you know, in introducing non-conviction-based forfeiture, but also applying it. So, Oscar, we've obviously heard that that uh, NCBF mechanisms are different from one uh, jurisdiction to another. Could you could you tell us a little bit about what the key issues were for Peru? How did Peru approach this? Uh, and what issues uh, do you believe a jurisdiction should consider based on your Peruvian ex uh, experience uh, when they plan to adopt a mechanism uh, to their local context? Oscar, please. Yes, hello to everyone. Thank you very much, Greta, for this very interesting and complex questions. And thank you for the organizer for inviting me. Um, your, your question touches upon several key elements that I would like to summarize as, as follows. The first one is, related, of course, to the criminal policy considerations in Peru. As a matter of fact, the Peruvian unconviction-based confiscation law belongs to a family of laws that is expanding uh, throughout Latin America, the latest ver version of which is the Extinción de Dominio uh, in Peru, um, adopted in Peru in 2018. As such, the Peruvian law is part of a broader criminal policy against organized financial crime in Peru, as especially expressly acknowledged in the preamble of the law. Since February 2019, specialized courts all over the country deal with non-conviction-based confiscation cases, and the early results of this system are encouraging and raise positive expectations among Peruvians. In terms of the model, the Peruvian legislator has implemented a fully autonomous legal action similar to the model of the United States Civil for Feature, uh, just described by, by Stefan which directs its action against the asset itself, a feature that has no precedent in the Peru Peruvian legal framework. Bringing to line with international standards, the Peruvian non-conviction-based confiscation law introduces new rules with a view to facilitate the recovery of the illicit assets. For example, the recovery of the illicit assets no longer depends on the criminal proceedings, and it applies variations in the required standards of proof vis-a-vis -vis criminal confiscation. The new Peruvian legislation therefore codifies years of jurisprudence aimed at striking a balance between the need to affect criminal assets and the respect for due process rules, expressly recognized in the law as fundamental principles. The practical and conceptual challenges in this field have been manifold in Peru. The current model of non-conviction-based confiscation evolved nevertheless as a reparative action more akin to a civil action for unlawful enrichment than to a criminal sanction, which represents the basis to apply civil standards to the proceedings. The Peruvian law, though relatively new, is a remarkable law enforcement tool that efficiently combines the pragmatism of the common law approach to asset recovery with the civil law traditional framework of fundamental rights. As key consideration, and in line with what has been said so far, um, these models uh, should consider at least two elements uh, that uh, seem uh, to be successful in the Peruvian context. The first is the creation of an specialized system. The earlier non-conviction-based confiscation law, which was enforced by criminal prosecutors and judges, succeeded in the recovery of foreign accounts in several high-profile cases. However, on the whole, it has had very modest results. The limited productivity of the former model has been associated with a lack of specialization. This was therefore um, an objective of the new law. 
In light of the encouraging results recently published by the Peruvian authorities, it seems clear that the strategy is producing still modest but positive results, particularly in the international recovery of corrupt related assets, which opens up several possibilities for other countries in the region seeking to recover confiscated as a, a stolen assets internationally. As important as the specialization of the system is in my view, the need to apply fair non-conviction based confiscation regimes by applying internationally recognized standards of due process. Additional lessons learned from the previous non-conviction based confiscation regime in Peru point out that the system is more effective if it is independent from criminal proceedings and if it additionally applies civil rules. The accomplishment of these objectives, however, generates several legal shortcomings in the states pertaining to civil law tradition, which, as already mentioned, do not provide for autonomous actions against assets. Non-conviction-based confiscation models must therefore implement proceedings with an appropriate balance between the state's necessity to recover criminal assets and fair rules. Particularly, these regimes should afford effective access to impartial and independent tribunals and the right to obtain reasoned decisions in at least two judicial instances. That said, the rights of the assets are not the same applied to persons. Likewise, the applicable standards are different whether we deal, we are deal with a civil action or a criminal accusation. Non-conviction-based confiscation is simply an action against assets which do not affect the right to personal liberty of the asset holder. Its purpose is to establish in a court of law the illicit nature of the asset, not the personal responsibility of the author of a crime. In other words, and to conclude, the punitive nature of non-conviction-based confiscation law is not prevailing. Insofar, these laws are reparative in nature and, they, and limit their scope to restoring a pre-existing and wrongful legal situation caused by the perpetration of a crime. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop there, Greta. Thank you, Oscar. And while you're stopping and we're moving on to Patrick with a question, I just wanted to point out to all of you, we've got some really pertinent and, and, and important questions already in the Q&A. So if, if, if some of the other panelists might want to have a quick look and think about, uh, hopefully towards the end, how we can answer those questions, that would be a fantastic question, such as is civil confiscation the same as non-conviction based confiscation? What's the difference between unexplained wealth and, and NCBF, et cetera? So, so very, very pertinent questions. Patrick, if I can turn to you. Uh, in Luxembourg, do you, uh, I know the answer, but not necessarily everyone in the audience knows the answer. Do you have uh, some form of an NCBF procedure, for example, when it's not possible to try suspects due to illness or because they've absconded or, or other such situations? And if you don't have, or, or maybe only elements of it, is that something that's been discussed in Luxembourg? Yes, hello, thank you for the question and thank you also for the invitation to speak to you uh, and to this uh, distinguished uh, panel. Uh, as you know, in Luxembourg, uh, as a civil law country, we have a gen as a general rule that uh, the conviction-based confiscation system prevails. It, not, it does not allow in realm confiscations uh, to be ordered without prior convictions. However, uh, two, one and a half exception exists. Uh, it is indeed allowed in Luxembourg to the court to order confiscation of property which were used or intended to be used to commit money laundering or terrorism offenses. Uh, it can be confiscated even in case of acquittal, of exception of punishment, termination of criminal proceedings, or where prosecution of such offenses is time barred. This provision was intro introduced in uh, 2001. Uh, that uh, was inter alia to ratify a convention of the Conseil de l'Europe from 1990. As a result of this reform, uh, the money laundering and terrorism crimes uh, created the possibility to order the confiscation without prior conviction, but this exception already has existed prior to this date till uh, 1973 there was a law for combating drug addiction which allows the court to order confiscation also of drug proceeds but it was a very restricted uh, possibility it was only if the suspect has uh, deceased or is severely sick and is not there is no other possibility to uh, 
to, take, to, to get a conviction. So you can see that uh, the exceptions which are open for uh, non-conviction based confiscations are very, uh, very small. It's not a general system like in other maybe countries or common law countries to use this uh, form of confiscation. It is only restricted to the proceeds of money laundering and terrorism offenses and to the products of uh, drug in, uh, offenses. Uh, that's what the actual status of the law in Luxembourg is now. It has been in 2017 a bill of law which proposed for further extend, extending the material scope of the application and to generalize the possibility to order non-conviction based uh, confiscations of proceeds of any criminal offenses punished by a minimum of uh, several years of imprisonment. But the proposal was however rejected by the parliament mainly because uh, the proposed measure, as the opinion of the Parliament, could have raised serious doubts as to its conformity to the European Court of Human Rights case law. And I'm not in the position to say uh, today if uh, the Luxembourg uh, government or the Luxembourg uh, Parliament will touch again on this subject. Uh, it should be. It's uh, my personal opinion is that it's very important to go in this direction, to be in conformity of all the international uh, conventions and treaties. But um, as public prosecutor, I cannot speak for the other uh, powers in the state. And um, I just hope to, that we can use the, all the experience of the other countries and to implement also on our national basis, uh, non-conviction non based confiscations. Thanks very much, uh, Patrick. And um, actually, your response tallies uh, with uh, our experience, and I'm sure that of ICARA as well, that very often in one's first interaction with a country, there'll be a, um, a first, uh, w w this is in no way possible, there is no uh, exception, nothing. And then actually, if you start digging a bit deeper, you find here and there, there are little pockets where you can say, well, if we were to build on that concept, maybe we could do something. And I think it's very interesting that, that you echo that. Um, Nonna, um, uh, Patrick already mentioned uh, the, the, the case law of uh, the European Court of Human Rights. We've uh, been talking about the intersection of both common, the, the, what Oscar called the, the, the practicality of, of the common law approach and the more fundamental law focused approach of, of civil law countries, but we were also talking about criminal law versus civil law in a different way. And it, I was very struck when we were preparing for this session, um, you, you said, look, you can always find arguments on, on either side. The fundamental thing is, if you believe in the concept, if you believe that this can work, then you will find a way to make it work uh, from a human rights point of view. And I thought it was very refreshing to hear something like that from a judge. Um, and I'd, I'd be interested in your experience as, as a judge, um, how, do, how do courts, how do the Euro European Court of Human Rights approach non-conviction-based forfeiture to ensure compliance with human rights standards? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for your invitation. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here with you today. And I'll discuss Georgian model of non-conviction-based confiscation known as administrative confiscation. Introduction of this measure into the Georgian legislation by virtue of amendments of 2004 was one of the measures aimed at bolstering efforts to combat corruption and other serious offenses entailing unjust enrichment. Administrative confiscation was directed at recovering wrongfully acquired property and unexplained wealth from public official, letters, family members, close relatives, and so-called connected persons, even without prior criminal convictions. These proceedings could have been initiated only after charging an official with specific offenses under the criminal code, regardless, regardless whether the official in question was still in the office or not. If public prosecutor had a reasonable suspicion that the property in question might have been acquired wrongfully, he or she could file an action with the court demanding the confiscation of, of wrongfully acquired property and unexplained wealth. Prosecutor's action for confiscation 
had to be substantiated with sufficient, sufficient documentary evidence. The burden of proof then be shifted onto the respondent. If the respondent failed to refute the public prosecutor's claim, the court, after having ensured that the prosecutor's claim was properly substantiated, would order the confiscation of the property. For Fisher procedure became an object of extensive debate in Georgia. In 2005, the Constitutional Court of Georgia closed legal debate at the domestic stage after finding the challenge in which the legislative framework to be compatible with the constitution. In 2015, the European Court of Human Rights in the landmark case of Gogitidze and others against Georgia asserted that implemented measures also complied with the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. Allow me to outline the principal facts of the case. The first applicant uh, was the high-ranking pu public official. Other applicants were his uh, sons and, uh, and brother. In 2004, the first applicant was charged, among others, uh, for, with abuse of authority and extortion. Shortly thereafter, the prosecutor's office initiated administrative proceedings to confiscate their property. Prosecution argued that official income of the first applicant in his capacity as a senior official could not have sufficed to finance the acquisition of disputed property. Prosecution's argument were substantiated with numerous pieces of evidence. By the final ruling of the Supreme Court of Georgia from 2005, it was established that the applicants had failed to prove lawful origins of monetary resources that have been used to acquire property with the exception of three assets. The remaining property was confiscated in favor of the state. Important to know that it was only in 2010 when the first applicant was convicted of offenses. As to the analysis of the European Court, first of all, it noted that disputed administrative confiscation procedure notwithstanding the terminology used by the domestic legislation, by its nature was a civil action in REM. The court identified two main issues raised by the case. First, by the shifting of burden of proof of lawful origin of the property linked to corruption onto respondents. And the second, the possibility of ordering confiscation of property without a final conviction first establishing the existence of an offense of corruption satisfied conventional standards. The court adjudicated the case based on Article 1 of Protocol 1 of the Convention, which guarantees the right to property. The court accepted that confiscation measure had sound legal basis and was foreseeable. The court observed that legislation had compensatory and preventive aim. Thus, it served legitimate purpose, which was to prevent unjust enrichment through corruption by sending a clear signal to public officials that corruption would not serve their or their family's pecuniary interest to the detriment of the community. Proportionality aspect was examined under two headings. First, whether the procedure for forfeiture of property was arbitrary, and second, whether domestic courts acted without arbitrariness. Assessing if the procedure for forfeiture was arbitrary, the court observed that confiscation of proceeds of corruption-related offenses was common European and even in universal legal standards, introduction of which had been strongly advised to Georgia by international bodies in view of alarming levels of corruption. The court recognized the visible achievements of Georgia in eradicating corruption only a few years after the introduction of those measures. Taking into account more or less compatible case law, the court did not see any problem in finding the confiscation to be proportionate even in the absence of a conviction. It underscored that whenever a confiscation order was the result of civil action in REM, Instead of beyond reasonable doubt standard, which applies in criminal proceedings, the proof on balance of, prob or, of, or of probability or a high probability of illicit origins combined with the inability of the owner to prove the contrary 
would satisfy the proportionality test under Article 1 of Protocol 1 of the Convention. Assessing whether the domestic courts acted without arbitrariness, the court observed that they duly examined the prosecutor's claim in the adversarial proceedings in light of numerous supporting documents. Applicants were given a reasonable opportunity to putting forward their case and even managed to remove some of the assets from the confiscation list. Consequently, having regards to the Georgian state's wide margin of appreciation in combating corruption in public service, the court concluded that there was no arbitrariness in the domestic court's actions and found no violation of right to property. The court rejected the applicant's fair trial complaint as manifestly unfounded, considering that they had themselves chosen to waive their right to take part in the proceedings and that there had been nothing arbitrary to expect them to discharge their part of the burden of proof by refuting the prosecutor's substantiated suspicions. The applicant also complained that authorities violated their right to be pres uh, presumed innocent. This complaint was also declared inadmissible as civil proceedings in REM without conviction is not a punitive but a preventive and, and or compensatory nature. And thus criminal law principles do not apply. To conclude the court, the European court considers that confiscation of property linked to serious criminal offenses without the prior existence of a criminal conviction is a common European legal standard. These proceedings do not require application of criminal law principles. State enjoy wide margin, wide margin of appreciation in developing and implementing policies aimed at the introduction of non-conviction based confiscation mechanisms with the condition that relevant legal standards, including the fair trial guarantees are in place. Thank you for your attention. Nona, thank you so much. I, I, I am in awe that you were able to put so much content into such a short and very, very concise presentation. Thank you. You're ping-ponging from civil to criminal uh, proportionality. You talked about terminology. There's so much in your presentation. I think we we maybe just have to go over over time by about 24 hours to, to, to unplug some of these issues. But since we don't have 24 hours or maybe follow on webinars, let me move on to Oscar and then immediately followed by Patrick, because I'd like to untangle a little bit that issue of one state has non conviction based, another state may not have it or has pockets of it, as, as Emil was, was saying. So I'd like to maybe first turn to Oscar, and I know, Oscar, you've worked with Patrick on this, on this conundrum of how to make it happen internationally. So, first of all, what are some, you know, under the UN Convention, states are committed to afford each other the widest measure of cooperation. How, what, how is that possible? What are some of the avenues you can recommend for states to look at when at first sight it looks like, well, they can't because they don't have non-conviction based full stop, right? That's never going to be enough of an answer. What could be the answers they could find? Thank you, Greta. Well, the answer to your question belongs to the to the area of international mutual legal assistance in criminal matters, of course, which in general has been exposed to, to very little uh, uh, decisions and non-conviction based confiscation. Um, although the picture remains unclear, it should be noted that international practice has evolved positively in the past few years. Countries people is reluctant to enforce foreign MLA requests based on non-conviction based confiscation, currently enforce them including international financial centers. Several factors may explain this fact, including the application of the international legal framework for asset recovery as a whole, including obligations arising from various legal sources, including soft law. The UNCAC, for example, introduces the obligation to, for states parties to cooperate in criminal matters with a view to recover assets to the widest extent possible. In fact, Asset recovery is nothing less than a fundamental principle under UNCAC and a shared responsibility of requesting and requested states as acknowledged in the preamble of the convention. As a consequence of this, a foreign unconviction based confiscation request needs to be carefully evaluated by the requested state, who should do everything in its power to facilitate the international asset recovery procedures. 
A blunt denial to provide MLA in this field seems therefore conflicted with the international obligations under UNCAC. A refusal to execute MLA requests should only be possible if there are justified reasons to consider that the foreign procedure severally breaches the principles of the requested state's domestic law. Furthermore, the refusal to cooperate should be sufficiently reasoned and clearly explain why it is not possible to provide MLA in such scenarios. On the side of the state requesting the return of the assets, the principle of shared responsibility under UNCAC refers to the adoption of fair procedures that are compatible with international law standards, in particular with regards to procedural and fundamental rights. As an example, the Peruvian experience in executing such typologies of confiscation in Switzerland shows that the Swiss high courts do not focus exclusively in the name or the category of the foreign procedure, but attach a crucial importance to the requesting states adherence to universal human rights instruments. The Swiss Supreme Court, for instance, has declared on several occasions that Peruvian non-conviction-based confiscation decisions are compatible with Swiss law standards based on these human rights considerations. Applying a case-by-case case case approach, the Swiss authorities have proactively ruled that in similar scenarios, equivalent solutions would have been found in the Swiss law to recover the illicit assets and therefore fostering the collaboration with the Peruvian counterparts. While much remains to be done to make these tools universally acceptable, it has become clearer that international practice will accept them as appropriate means to recover illicit assets insofar these laws respect internationally recognized human rights standards as a common language through which states can effectively cooperate and communicate universally. Thank you very much, Brenda. Thank you, Oscar. And immediately over to Patrick. Um, which of these uh, interesting avenues that Oscar has painted has Luxembourg taken or would Luxembourg take if it were faced with a request for executing an NCBF um, confiscation? You must be careful that if you take an avenue to come to Luxembourg, you will miss it uh, because it's a very small country. So don't come too fast to Luxembourg and don't take the avenues. But um, uh, as you know, as I stated before, the general system for confiscation in Luxembourg is conviction-based. So we have a problems to understand in the first beginning uh, the concept of non-conviction-based confiscations. But uh, Luxembourg as a party to most of the applicable international conventions and including the Merida Convention and also in compliance with all the European regulations, always tries to provide all possible support in the ex execution of foreign confiscation orders. Uh, our code of criminal procedure, besides other formal requirements like uh, the respect of uh, human rights, uh, states requires that the foreign confiscation order must be based either on a conviction, which is a classical situation, or which is more interesting, on a judicial decision of a criminal nature. And that's our opening door for uh, enforcing the, the um, non-conviction-based executions. But there remains very, still a very close link that must exist between the criminal charges brought against the suspect and the conviction and the confiscation of the product of the crime which is requested. And I think, in my opinion, this brings us to uh, the crucial question that the Luxembourg court has to ask itself before declaring the foreign decision enforceable. What is the nature of the decision to be enforced? If it is a classical conviction, we can tick the box, there's no problem. But for all non-conviction-based confiscations, the things are more complicated. You surely know that uh, the prevailing view of the European Court of Human Rights is that non-conviction-based confiscation proceedings are civil in nature which is not a very good point for our procedure, because I, if you remember, we need a judicial decision of a criminal nature. So the advantage may be to pass through the civil convictions in different countries is counterproductive for our executor decisions and procedures. But the Luxembourg court will not only look at the 
term used by the foreign country, but it will refer to its own criteria and is not bound by the terminology used in the requesting country in order to test where, whether the foreign decision is of a civil nature or of a criminal nature. But one thing is sure, a purely civil confiscation decision cannot be declared enforceable by Luxembourg court. But uh, don't be afraid, uh, I can take two decisions as examples that it can work also in Luxembourg. The first one was uh, execution of a British National Crime Agency claim for civil recovery. I insist on the claim for civil recovery. But by a decision in 2015 already, the Luxembourg court considered that confiscation can be executed on the assets seized in Luxembourg, even without a criminal conviction of the suspect, but because the British decision expressly states that the money constitutes the proceeds of an illegal activity and that the facts held against the suspect are also punishable in Luxembourg, the execution of the confiscation could be granted. The National Crime, Crime Agency confirmed us that this decision was very significant for the UK authorities because it was the first time that the foreign court has recognized and enforced United Kingdom civil recovery order on this uh, precept. The second decision is one you uh, uh, nearly mentioned and uh, on which we are working together and with the help of uh, Oscar uh, in relation of the enforceability of a Peruvian confiscation order. And uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that there, again, Luxembourg is a sort of a test uh, for uh, Peru because we are the first country which has been addressed, uh, the, sorry for my Spanish, but it is called uh, in, in non-dominion, uh, you know what I mean. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and I can confirm uh, for the time now that the first instance decision has been uh, taken uh, one month ago or three weeks ago, and it has accepted the non-conviction uh, non based confiscation. So, for the time now, the decision is not final because it could have be it could go to appeal, but uh, it seems that we are moving in a good direction and that in the assistance to uh, the foreign countries, we are moving much faster in Luxembourg than for the, our national affairs where non -convic non conviction based confiscation is uh, not still not possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. And, and lot, lots to unpack there in, in how uh, foreign concepts can still be incorporated, even if it's, if it's not uh, recognized in, in the law itself. There are ways of thinking about that. Very, very interesting. Uh, in the interest of time, moving quickly on back to Nonna, do you see any other uh, challenges on the horizon as far as non-conviction-based forfeiture mechanisms are applied that uh, the courts might have to be uh, decide on in, in, in the near future. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I will approach this question from the perspective of the European Court of Human Rights. Of course, it will be in, in abstract. First of all, I would like to um, address the question of competence of national courts and its impact on cross jurisdictional enforcement of non-conviction based confiscation. It is important that independent and impartial domestic courts that are established by law have clear statutory jurisdiction to decide on and order non-conviction based confiscation. The right to a fair trial in Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights requires that the case be heard by independent and impartial tribunal established by law. Established by law, covers not only the legal basis for the very existence of a tribunal, but also compliance by a tribunal with the particular rules that govern it. A law should be accessible and foreseeable and clarity of the law is required concerning the subject matter jurisdiction of the court, as well as the procedure. Uh, where regulations leave uncertainty about the scope of court's competence, it may not be regarded as foreseeable and may not provide protection against arbitrariness. It may also impede a person's ability to present his or her case effectively before the court and violate 
uh, various rights, including right to property, which can be uh, invoked if the application uh, of non conviction based confiscation is challenged in the court. The second point I want to raise is the emergency of divergent case law on confiscation, which may contribute to uncertainties. Development of the case law that limits the application of civil law procedures in confiscation cases is a possibility. The case that deserves particular attention in view of future developments is David and Teresa Gale against the United Kingdom. The application concerns civil recovery proceedings against the applicant under the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002, which resulted in around 2 million pounds in property being confiscated from the applicants. No prior criminal proceedings against the applicant had taken place in the United Kingdom. The UK court found on balance of probability that unlawful conduct, namely drug trafficking, money laundering, and tax evasion had taken place. The applicants had previously been acquitted of criminal charges of drug trafficking and money laundering in Portugal. And the facts behind those charges form the basis of some of the allegations in the later civil proceedings in the United Kingdom. According to the UK law, the proceedings were regarded as civil. The purpose of the proceeding was not punitive but deterrent, and or deterrent, but was to recover assets that did not lawfully belong to the applicants. One of the key issues raised by the case concerns the applicability of presumption of innocence to civil recovery proceedings. Another question for consideration is whether the protection afforded by a presumption of innocence applies where the subsequent proceedings take place in a different state to the forum state of the criminal proceedings. The case will also indicate whether right to fair trial was violated as a result of the fact that civil and not criminal standard of proof was applied. And again, to, to, to come back to Gogitiz's case, which was reaffirmed in a follow-up Romania case, creates a solid ground for introduction of non conviction based confiscation as a tool to fight against corruption, as long as relevant legal safeguards are in place and fair trial guarantees are respected. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nonna. So uh, we're not out of the woods yet. Still further issues to be decided and, 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 and possibility that um, the divergent case law uh, gives, gives people pause and say, well, maybe that's a bit of overreach. Maybe we need to uh, rethink certain uh, issues again. Uh, Steph, finally, back to you. What steps can we take to increase the use of non-conviction based forfeiture mechanisms and what do you think the significant developments coming up in the next couple of years? You've worked on this already many years. You've seen lots of experience around the world. What do you think is in store for us when it comes to uh, non-conviction based forfeiture? You're, you're muted, Steph. Okay, sorry about that. Well, it's always a challenge to explain things uh, in, a, in a situation where it's an unfamiliar procedure. And so the imp most important thing, if you're in speaking with policymakers or legislators or judges in a jurisdiction that does not have non-conviction based forfeiture is to explain how it works and explain the examples and to make sure everyone understands that due process is not surrendered just because we're dealing in a civil as opposed to a criminal context. That there's all the procedures that re are required to guarantee due process are, are included in a non-conviction based forfeiture scheme. Uh, the right to notice, the right to a tribunal that uh, litigates the, the merits of the case, the right to have the government bear the burden of proof, the right to insist on the confiscation uh, being proportional to the gravity of the offense and so many other things which are sort of inherent in the notions of due process. All of those are part of the non-conviction based forfeiture schemes in the jurisdictions that have been uh, able to enact them. And then in jurisdictions that do have them, but don't yet employ them, uh, that you have to go in and, and train people. You have to overcome the skepticism of the judiciary to, some, to, a, to a new concept. You have to overcome the failure of the 
um, law enforcement agencies to uh, apply resources to something that they have never used before. You have to train prosecutors. It's an area, it's a specialty. There's no doubt but that it's a specialty and that lawyers have to have some understanding of what is a, um, you know, a procedure that does not have too many other parallels. And, uh, and in our country, we've had to dedicate certain prosecutors as uh, non-conviction-based forfeiture specialists because of the, the myriad of issues uh, that arise. But it's just, it's a matter of doing what we're doing right now. It's just going in international forum and, and, uh, and conferences. And if we ever get to meet in person once again, to have these conversations over tea and uh, at dinner and explain how it works. And uh, uh, those of us who have done it for a long time are happy to continue to do that. Thank you very much, Steph. We have uh, four minutes left and 25 unanswered questions, which means we have 10 seconds per question. Um, actually, but Steph, while I have you, I think there, there are two relatively basic questions that do need clarification if, if, you, can, if you can try to answer them in one minute. Uh, they came fairly at the beginning and they were asking whether civil confiscation is the same as non-conviction based forfeiture. And they're also asking to understand the difference between unexplained wealth and non-conviction based forfeiture. Is it just a matter of terminology? How complicated or easy can you answer these questions? Because I hear them all the time. Well, the first one may be just a matter of terminology. I mean, you can call it non-conviction based forfeiture. You can call it civil confiscation. You can call it Mary Jane. It's, it's, it's the process that we've just described and whatever the terminology it is. But uh, unexplained wealth and um, uh, civil forfeiture are two different things. Unex to do it, civil forfeiture or non-conviction based forfeiture is a procedure. The procedure is based on an underlying cause of action. The cause of action may be drug trafficking, it may be public corruption, it may be um, child pornography distribution. If your jurisdiction has made the possession of unexplained wealth a basis for confiscation, then it is the cause of action. On the other hand, in the United States, unexplained wealth is merely a piece of evidence that you use to in, in, in the government's process of establishing that, the, that this money is indeed proceeds of crime. The person has modest income and uh, he has no other source of income, and, but he's a criminal, then this, this money is more likely than not to be criminal proceeds. Thank you very much. Does any of the other panelists want to add to what Steph just said? I also have, I uh, can't see. I have one question, a quick one for you. I'm trying to find those that don't need another 10 minutes. But Oscar, um, I think someone called Anna was asking whether, was particularly interested in knowing about other countries in Latin America that have non-conviction base. And this is, of course, a project that we're currently working on, you know, finding out which other countries in Latin America and, and engaging in exactly the kind of discussion that Steph was describing. Can you give a snapshot of the situation in Latin America, maybe? Yes, thank you, Greta. Uh, in, in Latin America, is uh, non-conviction-based confiscation is developing a very different model. Yes. There are these models that are linked to the criminal prosecution, more or less in the model of the uh, uh, Merida Convention, Article 54 particularly, and others that are completely independent, like the Peruvian, the Colombia, or the Mexican model, which are the extinction de dominio or non-conviction-based confiscation. Um, I think the second one, for, for the reasons I'll explain it, are more effective in a sense that they, the system are producing concrete results, while the others seem to be stuck in time and producing very limited uh, results. Thank you. That's a, clear, that's a clear vote. Can I turn to Nona and Patrick just to see if they would like to add any thoughts to what they've heard now since they last spoke, because we will have to conclude sadly already in a couple of minutes. Nona, do you have any further final parting thoughts in preparation for the next conversation? Uh, nothing probably particular. There was some question about the evidence. Mm -hmm. Evidence can be everything that would prove that uh, the property is uh, uh, unexplained and uh, it can be uh, very diverse, starting from salary sheets and uh, uh, with the expert opinions, why, how much this property costs. So I, I thought that it was important to, to, to explain it, it, it depends and uh, how you approach the case and how much information you can gather in order to prove that this property is uh, un unexplained and the source of the funding is, cannot be explained. 
So overall, the only conclusion is that the system worked effectively in my own country. I'm, I'm from Georgia and I saw myself how effectively it worked based on this, uh, using this uh, mechanism uh, at that time, one billion of property was expropriated, uh, it was confiscated in, uh, and it helped the country to, to move to, to, to democracy actually. And that, that's why I, I strongly, um, uh, I'm a strong supporter of this system and uh, the conclusions of the European Court of Human Rights is another um, confirmation that if used properly, this system can generate this uh, success, but also can be in compliance with the human rights. Thank you very, very much, Nona. Patrick, did you want to add any further thoughts or did you see a question you wanted to answer before we conclude? Just 10 seconds. Uh, it was said that it's important to explain the procedure. And I think it is very important that the requesting state explains his, his procedure to the executing state. It simplifies really uh, the execution of the confiscation and it's much easier uh, and everybody is more um, at disposal to execute this confiscation if you have the explanations. In our common case, we had the help of uh, Oscar from your institute who uh, gave us a lot of explanations to the uh, new legislation in Peru and that's definitely a thing that helped a lot to execute these sort of confiscations. And I think also just to close my remark that it's important to get in contact before sending these confiscation orders. Uh, and then uh, I want to stress out that this, uh, the current contact points are available in all the countries and it is very interesting to get in touch with them before sending uh, maybe the request and to orientate it to the direct to the correct uh, reception uh, desk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. And I'd like to thank uh, all the panelists for for having uh, been courageous enough to 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 come to a one hour panel on a topic that clearly needs a lot more than an hour. I think you've been fantastic in being very, very concise uh, to the point, giving practical examples, a lot of food for thought. Uh, I think, Patrick, uh, you said something which, which is so essential. This, this, you know, oftentimes we think it's a law, we apply the law, we follow the procedure, we send it to Luxembourg or to some other country and then, well, you know, and then it happens. But it's not that. The law is something that, that, that lives. It's a, it's, it's a living instrument in a way that we should see as that, an international cooperation anyway. And I think this kind of collaboration, this kind of dialogue is really what we're looking for. And I'd like to thank all all the colleagues in Luxembourg and all the other countries that are willing to really engage in dialogue and not just look at the law and say it looks black and white because it is never black and white and we should really see uh, where we can push this needle forward. Thank you so much all the panelists. I would suggest that most of the questions will be hopefully addressed in the, in the, in the document that we will um, prepare after the webinar. I will make sure we pick up many of those questions, even if they weren't directly uh, addressed in the webinar itself, we'll try to answer them in writing with the document that will be made public in a couple of weeks from now. So with that, thank you again, all the panelists, uh, wonderful audience for your very interesting questions and your attention and uh, enjoy the rest of the ANGAS seminars. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Also, by the way, apologies on behalf of Emil who had to jump off and uh, already moderates another panel two minutes ago. Thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.